Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. <laughs> Let's go on ahead. Listen, if someone bites me in the balls, I should go to a dentist so that he can find out who it was by checking the dental records. Right? Thank you. Wouldn't you know? Well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's dark. Let's do NWA. NWA. And trust me, it would be dark if somebody bit me in the balls. September 6th, 1986. I really hope you're screaming this. Like, I, hope I hope your window's down a crack as you're sitting in the parking lot. <laughs> no, it's not. And man, there's so many fuckers here on vacation. I feel like I'm not a native here. I don't live here. But I'm here more than most tourists. So it's Labor Day weekend, and there's just people everywhere. I'm like, go home, people. Give me a break. Blowing off fucking fireworks on the beach while my baby's trying to sleep. I'm ready to go down there and get shooting. Mm. By the way, I want to throw one thing out before we start. If you go to my Twitter, at Brian Alvarez, pinned at the top is Granny's note to all of you who want to buy my memoirs or her memoirs that she wrote about me the pricing the paypal address it's all up there on my twitter at brian alvarez you can afford you can avoid her facebook at all costs but it'll give you the amount of money to send to granny and then she will get a copy of the days in the life of brian alvarez out to you as soon as possible so head over there to my twitter at brian alvarez and check it out thank you Vinny. okay NWA Championship Wrestling from September 6th, 1986. The show, uh, without commercials, went an hour and seven minutes or something. So, as always, the default excuse is maybe there's a baseball game. They announced that the U.S. Tag Team Tournament will be a one-night event held in Atlanta. And Jim Cornette was back as guest host. Back as guest host. And it was funny, because he, of course, comes out and cuts a promo and says, Oh, of course, the Midnight Express are going to win. There's no other team that can hold the candle with them. And they're going to win those U.S. tag titles, and before long, be world champions again. So the first match is Buddy Landell and Bill Dundee versus Johnny Cook and Rocky King. Oh, Johnny fucking Cook, dude. Well, the more important, well, relevant to the conversation that I started with, Cornette totally switches tone, and he's talking about Landell and Dundee, and he is, you've never heard someone give a more sport, uh, sporting speech. It's unfortunate only one team can win that tournament. Should the Minute Express face Dundee and Landell, I just hope we find a way to come out on top. Two minutes ago, he had all but guaranteed victory. So, yes, Johnny Cook was the guy who last week, in eight seconds of ring time, convinced us he was the worst wrestler we'd ever seen. He was much better this week, and by that I mean he was horrible. He was, here's what I wrote. Cook was 1,000 times better this week. Now he is only one of the ten worst wrestlers of all time. Yes. So Landell finished him off with a corkscrew elbow in the figure four. They announced that later on in the show, it is going to be Ole and Arn Anderson, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew, against the Kansas Jayhawks, which, they note, is a main event anywhere in the world. Yeah, they said that a few times, and they were <laughs> lying every time. <laughs> that was quite the statement right there. I also liked... Uh, Rocky King did what I could only describe as a reverse monkey flip out of the corner. And it was actually awesome. <laughs> Cornette interviewed the Koloffs, who put over Landell and Dundee as that team was passing by them towards the back. Let me mention one more thing about Landell. I apologize. Landell, they got Cook in the ring, and they just beat the shit out of this guy. I mean, they beat the shit out of him. You got to go back and watch some of this stuff, including at one point Landell drops an elbow on this guy's neck as the guy is on his stomach. He just fucking drops his whole elbow weight on the back of this guy's neck. I think they were trying to kill Johnny Cook. To ensure no one would ever have to wrestle him again. Yeah, they were trying to do the business. I shouldn't say that. God bless Johnny Cook. I'm sure he no. got better. Well, he did improve greatly this week. Vinny, this man does not deserve to be sent to hell because he had a bad match last week. Anyway, the Koloffs put over Landell and Dundee, says they are a very talented team. We respect them. But we have orders from the Kremlin. And the orders are to conquer America and win the U.S. tag titles themselves. God knows they could be killed if they disobey the orders of the Kremlin. 
They said Nikita had won the United States Singles Championship. That was very important to the Kremlin. So they had ordered Ivan and Crusher Khrushchev to enter this tournament as a team. And they ran down every baby face in the world as a top contender to Nikita's title, but vowed that Nikita would remain a USA champion. I love the idea at, I don't know, 12.05 a.m. Moscow time every Sunday morning. The Kremlin sits down to watch this NWA championship wrestling to mm-hmm. make sure that the Russians are doing good for their country. It's important. Their their messages are getting across to all those uh, evil Americans. Yes. Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA, Magnum TA came out for a promo. They are in a tournament as well. They're doing That's so true. much better building up this tournament than they are Clash of the Champions on Raw. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, and, and, we're, and we're 10 minutes in. So Dusty reminds everyone this tournament is only being held because he had put Ole Anderson on the shelf in the first place. They show the brand new USA, or the brand new U.S. Tag Team Championships. They had red, uh, red leather straps. The fans did not boo them. Yeah, you know, it was so ironic that they had this on the show here because I ranted about this goddamn WWE Universal title or whatever. And you guys looked at me like I was crazy. And these fans, how dare they boo the belt and I don't get it. Listen, they're building up this tournament for the new belt. And when they mentioned, when they mentioned there will be new belts, the fans cheered. And then they showed the new belts and everybody cheered. Because belts are cool. And new belt designs are cool. So when WWE kept the goddamn belt a secret all the way to SummerSlam, and you're all excited you're going to see a new belt, it's the same fucking belt. No wonder they booed. Get with the program, WWE. Well, on that note, they're also doing WWE on SmackDown. We're also doing a tag team tournament. The new SmackDown tag titles are cool looking. They look exactly like the Raw ones, but at least they're they're like dimes instead of pennies. Blue and silver is cooler than black and copper. We had Ron Garvin and Dick Murdoch versus Brody Chase and Alan Martin. First of all, Garvin takes Chase down. He's got him in a front face lock. So that's losing his left arm. His right arm is free. So he says, what can I do with his right arm? I know. I'm going to put a claw hold on this dude's kidney. So he just squeezes his back. Murdoch comes in. He goes to do the amateur wrestling display and smother Martin. And Martin has no idea how to escape. I could have smothered this guy. They made a fool out of him. Garvin beat him with a knockout punch. And they showed this punch in super slow-mo. And in super slow-mo, it looks very much like a fake punch. You know, all I got out of this was that this Brody Chase fella looked like a very fat, young Shawn Michaels or a fat, young Bobby Eaton. And the other guy, Martin, looked like an older, fatter Dalton Castle. What a team that would be. Huh. Young Shawn Michaels and old Dalton Castle. They did not wrestle. There will be no point in Shawn Michaels' life where he's not a better wrestler than these men. No, no Dalton, I'm talking physical appearance. Or Dalton Castle, for that matter. So Garvin and Murdoch did a promo after the uh, commercial. And Garvin mumbles and stumbles through his lines for a while. And Murdoch puts over all the teams in the field. So he's just proud to be there, proud to be teaming with Ronnie Garvin. And with the tournament, we can't all win. And friendship goes out the window. You know, it was... Struck me. You know who Murdoch reminded me of here? You'll never guess. Well? The Big Show. He was much taller than Ronnie Garvin. <laughs> no. He reminded me of The Big Show because Dick Murdoch is a guy where when he's a babyface, he's the nicest, friendliest, okay, happiest yes. dude. <laughs> got his arm around the guy. He's got his yes. soft southern accent. Such a nice fella. When he's a bad guy, he's a fucking total dick. Just yes. like just like the Big Show. The Big Show was not the same character whether he was a face or a heel. When he was a good guy, he was a happy, jolly giant that you just want to hang out with and give a big hug to. And when he was a heel, he was a giant monster and he was mean looking and you thought he'd beat your ass if you crossed him and he you know, it's just amazing. And Wahoo McDaniel versus Lee Peak. So Cornette is running his mouth when he interrupts himself. Suddenly announces he has a phone call and he has to leave, and he disappeared until the very end of the show. 
Well, the phone call was the rock and rolls are about to come out, and so he got the fuck out of Dodge. Well, yeah, but he would always do this when uh, maybe things would come out, but then he would always come back in the next segment. Well, maybe the idea was that he wanted to avoid the rock and rolls, and so he pretended that he got a phone call and he left. And then while he was gone, he called his mom, and then his mom gave him a massive guilt trip about them not having the tag team titles. That's why he came back in tears. So Wahoo beat up Lee Peak, had him pinned after a chop, but picked him up and put him in a chin lock. It's a Wahoo. That pissed me off. <laughs> it's a Wahoo. He didn't move fast, but he moved well. Sure. Late 40s. And he just beat this guy's ass with a look of complete disgust on his face. Like, dude, I'm giving you the opportunity to do something, and you ain't doing shit, so I'm going to beat your ass even worse. Eventually, he won with a double arm suplex. I love Wahoo. I love Wahoo McDaniel. <laughs> Rock and Roll Express versus Phil Brown and Ray Aaron. Phil they, Brown yeah. and Ray Aaron. Yes. How the fuck do they get these names? Mr. and Mrs. Brown and Mr. and Mrs. Aaron. Phil Brown and Ray Aaron. So they beat up one dude for a while. They dragged him across the ring to tag the other guy in. They beat the second man up for a while. And they tagged the first man back in, and they hit him with a double drop kick, and they pinned him. See, what I liked about this show, Vinny, that you clearly didn't, is that normally when there's baseball or something that restricts the show to an hour, it's like 95 matches that all go 10 seconds. That's true. But tonight, it was five matches or eight matches or whatever that got a little bit of time. The Rock and Rolls decided they were going to put in some time. And sure. they went in there, and they, they, they demonstrated their technical wrestling prowess which was actually quite impressive on the part of Ricky Morton and then they did the double drop kick Ric Flair and Baby all came out for a promo it must be said actually I have two comments here first of all uh, Baby Doll since she has left Dusty Rhodes and has started hanging out with Ric Flair and dressing like Ric Flair she's gotten a lot hotter oh yeah she looks w I thought that same thing she looks so much better since she hooked up with Flair and she has all the fancy outfits on. The the, the uh, high fashion look is so much better than the mom jeans and sh and blouses, cowboy blouses she wore with Dusty. Huge upgrade. Second of all, I love. If you will recall, <laughs> this all started when uh, we when we started watching this. Baby doll was hanging out with Tully Blanchard. She left Tully for Dusty, then left Dusty for Flair. And Tully and Flair are both totally cool with this now. <laughs> they just moved on. It's in the past. No hard feelings. Well, so you know, Flair these these women, back then with the horsemen. That's right. Dime a dozen. That's right. Flair points out his shoes cost more than most people's houses. Fans are calling Baby Doll a traitor. Baby Doll dubbed the Road Warriors all show and no go. <laughs> Can you imagine, by the way... We think about ECW in 1996, 1997, 1998, and here we are a mere 10 years earlier, and this girl has now been with three guys, and her gimmick is that the second guy, she was his personal, and yeah. she has left him for Ric Flair because of his money, and all the fans can come up with is, you're a traitor. Traitor. <laughs> traitor. By the way, four guys, she's been with the Warlord, too. That's She's currently with the Warlord, that's right. Yes. So Flair congratulates Nikita on his U.S. title win, but warns him, don't come close to my world title. And he runs down the usual suspects with the usual one-liners. My favorite part of this is Flair just gets going, and he's on a roll. And he's ranting and raving and being Ric Flair. And Baby Doll, all of a sudden, she's just, like, gazing at him in awe. Like, look at this fucking guy. It's exactly the same thing that David Crockett does when Flair gets going. He just, he forgets where he's at, and he just is in awe of the greatness of Ric Flair standing right there in front of him cutting a promo. I love when guys do that. That's how good Flair was. Had the Road Warriors versus Art Pritz and Darren Evans. The Warriors won Kofi with a lariat. Not even a... Uh, not the top rope lariat, not the Doomsday device, just a plain old lariat. All I know is I hope it's the Road Warriors against Johnny Cook next week. <laughs> Uh, they showed, uh, they joined Tony Schiavone for a promo, and they pointed out they had already won a tournament this year, and he clocked a cup for a million dollars, and they promised to win, or they, or actually they threatened 
to win the U.S. tag title tournament, too, because they never made it clear or not that they'd actually be in the tournament. And I think in the end, I don't, I do not know this, this is not a spoiler, they may have kept them out of the t- uh, U.S. tag title tournament just because then they would have had to lose at some point. Had a tour of Green Bay and Minnesota coming up. They oh, dude, shows. you missed the best part of that promo. Hawk is doing his promo, and he calls Baby Doll an elephant. I was about to get to that. Yeah. Oh, you were? Okay. Well, Ellering right. had the best celebration you've ever seen when he called her an <laughs> elephant. Hawk called Baby Doll an elephant, compared her to an elephant in the zoo, and the fans all cheered. I, I, I'll be honest, I did not notice Paul Ellering's reaction. Oh my god, how could you miss him? Like, all you can see on screen is Hawk and Ellering in the background. I've never seen, I swear to god, I've never seen Paul Ellering so animated as he was here. He was laughing, and then he began pumping his fists and jumping up and down when Hawk <laughs> called her an elephant. You have to go back and watch this. Uh, they warned every team to stay out of their way. J.J. Dillon and Tully Blanchard came out for a promo. And he said, Dusty is now feuding with Big Bubba, and that's almost the words they used. But they knew they could not rely on Bubba to take Dusty out. Somehow he would rise and fight again. So they had to be prepared for themselves to face Dusty down the road. And Tully once again took credit for taking out Dusty's leg and costing him the world championship. Andersons versus the Kansas Jayhawks. Main event anywhere in the world. On a shitty card, it would be. Man, this Dutch Mantel could hit them ropes. Can Dean Ambrose watch this guy work? The talent balance on the Kansas Jayhawks was not close to 50-50. It may have been 90-10. So Dylan's out there on commentary. He doesn't even mention anything when the Jayhawks are doing illegal switches behind the ref's back. They had arm bars for a long time. The Andersons were trying to do the spot where they're, like, they're in an arm ringer and they reach over and try to tag out, but they're just a little bit too far away. But Jaggers always has them too close to the corner, so they had to pretend they couldn't touch hands. And then Mant- Mantel tagged in, and there was suddenly a great brawl going on. It was fantastic. It went to commercial. When they came back, we had a lot of arm bars from the Andersons. They bonked heads. Mantel tags in, makes a super hot comeback. And uh, eventually the horseman used Dylan's shoe for the DQ. Man, when Mantel grabbed his whip in clean house. When Dutch made that hot tag, David Crockett was just losing his shit. He was so excited. And then they have the DQ for shoe usage. Yes. In a sport where you can kick a man in the damn fucking face with your shoes on. You take that shoe off, and it's a deadly weapon. Think about all the guys that have worn cowboy boots to the ring. Yes. If you kick a man in the gut or in the face with the cowboy boots, that's okay. But if you take that boot off and swing it at him, man, that's just too much. So that was a nothing match, as it turns out. Crusher Khrushchev and Ivan Kulak come out for a promo. They list all the titles that they and Nikita have had, but lost due to American referees or American interference or American corruption. There was every team for themselves in this tournament, and that means... That means that the Americans would be divided and they would fall. Because you see, as Ivan Koloff explained, in Russia, or excuse me, in America, it is united we stand, divided we fall. In Russia, it is united we stand, divided we also stand. <laughs> Ivan was so great. Ivan is so, he's quickly growing on me. They vowed to win, they stopped to exchange hugs, and they left. You know what I got out of this was if you buckled down and you began going to the gym consistently, you would end up with a body like Crusher Khrushchev. Possible. He physically looked like a in-shape Vinny. He was, a, he was just a big man. He never had swollen muscles of, really of any kind. No, but he was he strong got, looking. He was a bar- big barrel-chested dude. He sure. was not a bodybuilder. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason we called you fucking Shoulders Torelli. We didn't call you Gut Torelli. We called you Shoulders Torelli because your shoulders are very wide. It should have been Belly Torelli. <laughs> Actually, that would have been... Oh, man. You're so lucky. <laughs> I gotta come back. I gotta come back now. <laughs> you could now, actually. Belly Torelli. You'd be so fucking over. <laughs> Especially nowadays on yeah. these indie shows where... Oh, man. Uh, hey, I told you about my idea for Cannon Beach Wrestling. There's a, VF, right. there's a VFW hall. Mm-hmm. Buddy's got a ring. Belly Torelli. 
Cannon Beach champion. Sure. Wahoo McDaniel came out for a promo. Shavani noted the Russians claim that the U.S. championship, not Wahoo's national championship, should be the top contender to the world title. They Wahoo just a- bought central states, by the way. So if you're wondering about all these belts and the central states invasion and everything like that, the, the territory yeah. had just been purchased for like six months or something before they sold it back. Yeah. I believe, and somebody else mentioned, and I'll, I'll admit I'm not an expert on this, so I, I, I haven't verified this, I can't, but I believe also what happened was the national titles were the top belts in the Georgia promotion, and the U.S. belts were the top belts in the Carolinas. And so since they're basically combining now, it's time to get rid of some of these. Yes. Okay. So Shivani notes this, that the Russians claim the U.S. title should be the top contender. Wahoo says, no, no, no. The national title has always been more prestigious. There's no reason to change that. So as they're having this discussion, Nikita comes out to wrestle Randy Barber. Wahoo is still on commentary. He was horrible. <laughs> I'll admit he's a fine athlete, but I'm in good shape, too. <laughs> he was like, I love Wahoo, and he's a no-nonsense sort of guy, and he, he didn't cut bad promos, but man, you put this guy in commentary, you couldn't think of a goddamn thing to say, and when he did, he just mumbled through it. Yeah, yeah. So the key to beat Randy Barber with a standing sickle. They immediately go back to Shivani and Wahoo. Out comes Jim Crockett. And Jim concedes, the Russians have a point. The U.S. title and the national championship, they both represent the same nation. Now, the NWA has gotten together. We've had a discussion on this, and we aren't going to order a unification match. But we have put the contract together. And should those two champions agree to defend their belts against each other, we will book a title unification match. Wahoo says, But we won't no force need- it. They will enforce it, yes. No, they won't force it. It's up to but the guys. Yes, yes. It is up to the champions themselves to determine this. And Wahoo says, this is not necessary. The national champion has always been the top contender, and that will just stay that way. So Ivan comes out. He says, Wahoo, you are afraid, unlike Nikita. Nikita wants to face you, Wahoo McDaniel, and take your belt. And so Wahoo, of course, can now not back down from this fight. And he says he will face Nikita in that match. And I assume they did book it this way, because they want the U.S. title, obviously, to be the, the top belt. And, but they wanted to, uh, basically, they wanted to uh, what's the word? They, they wanted to give the fans of the national title. They didn't want to just throw it away or throw it out. They wanted, just for one last moment there on TV, to have the national champion say, no, my belt is best. But anyway, it doesn't matter. You know, there was a period during Wahoo's promo where he says, well, I don't want a belt that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's like, wow, what a line. Like today, no belt means anything. Well, <laughs> that, that's very true. Tully Blanchard and Jimmy Garvin versus Henry Rutley and Mike Rose. Oh, what a team. This was- like, you couldn't have a worse team for Jimmy Garvin to be a part of because Tully was so fucking great. So Tully's out there being awesome, and then poor Jimmy Garvin tags in, and he's mostly a gimmick. And it's just like, boy, this guy is bad. God bless him. He's horrible. So they did explain that, of course, the Andersons were in the U.S. Tag Title Tournament. And Ric Flair was not going to be in it because he's, he's the world champion. He has title defenses to make. This left Tully Blanchard on, you know, with nothing to do. And rather than put him on the shelf, J.J. Dillon had scouted far and wide for a suitable tag team partner and found Jimmy Garvin. It also meant, by the way, that if this had happened just a few months ago, we would have had Baby Allen Precious in the same corner. Wow. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned earlier Dutch Mantell and running the ropes. Henry Rutley and Mike Rose awful at running the ropes. They may have never done it before. There's a period, I'm not sure which is which, but the skinny one where he hit the ropes and everyone's done it at some point where you you, know, you, you almost accidentally duck under the ropes and your your head kind of snaps under the top rope and then bounces back into it. He didn't do that. He did something I've never seen before where he hit the ropes almost too high and his neck would flash. It's <laughs> for a guy. <laughs> I, uh. I didn't know that it was possible to do that. Dude, there was a, what was I watching? May have been Raw. I was watching some show and somebody just randomly hit the middle rope. What was that? <laughs> I don't know. Ian Neville? No, it was a tall guy. It didn't make any sense. Anyway. No, no, no. 
So these two jobbers were terrible. And Toby Blanchard, he would give them offense, but the offense was so god-awful, he just refused to sell it. He was having no part of this. First, the skinny guy tags in, and he starts throwing these punches in the general vicinity of Tully's head. And Tully just looks at him and slaps him right in the face. <laughs> he drags him over to the corner. He's literally, out loud, begging him to do better, saying, we're on national TV. They work him over for a while. They get the fat guy back in there. And he starts throwing punches at Tully in the corner. And Tully stands straight up, and he just looks at him in disgust. He looks over at Garvin like, can you believe this shit? And he flies across the ring and beats the guy up. <laughs> and finally, the heels hit their finishes for the win. Double finish. As I, as I wrote here, the best horrible match I've seen in many a day. It was the old babyface double finish from two heels. Sure. The Warlord versus Jack Weathers. Or as Jim Crockett Jr. called him, or David Crockett, the Road Warrior. Actually, we called him was. He won the power slam like 10 seconds. And David Crockett says, your winner, the Road Warrior. Excuse me! <laughs> he doesn't correct himself. He never corrected himself. He just left it out there. And then, th it was so weird because <laughs> he apologizes... And they immediately cut to Tony Schiavone for an interview with the Warlord and Baby Doll. And David Crockett is nowhere to be seen. Like, he was so embarrassed that he screwed up that he, like, fled the building, it seemed like. <laughs> yeah. So Baby Doll just says that her relationship with Ric Flair is nobody's business but her own. At and this point, and the nation. At this point, a woman in the crowd screams, that's right! And Baby Doll threatens to take the road warrior, uh, I, I said it. She threatens to take the warlord to the Central States area and show those plainsmen something they've never seen before. That just made me laugh. <laughs> plainsmen. Well, Central States. There's nothing but plainsmen out there. I guess so. By the way, some plainsmen just walked by and waved in the window here. On the way back. I, I did. He looked like Dan Henderson. Oh. Uh, he wants an interview. They're gone. Uh, they left. Cornette returned. He accused David Crockett of going to Mama Cornette and ratting him out said, telling her that Jimmy had not been paying proper attention to the Midnight Express. He began to cry, said, none of this is his fault, none of this is their fault. We were screwed by a crooked ref. He promised to get the belts back and make his mama happy and said this is all David's fault, and that was that. Man, it was so sad. Poor guy, was, poor guy was weeping. He was. So there you go, everybody. That's uh, the that's show. NWA World Ch I like this show. I know Vinny didn't like it, but I Listen, we've seen a lot of bad shows. I thought this one was pretty good. It wasn't a bad show. It was just a missable show. There's nothing, nothing great happened here. Well, it doesn't look like there's another one until the 20th, so we don't have to worry about missing one for the WWE pay-per-view next weekend. Although I guess we will miss one head-to-head -head with Clash of the Champions or something like that. Who even knows? But no, figure it out. You're going to be mine all night long. I like the uh, reverb he put in there to make it even more yes. song-like. All right, NWA. NWA. And by the way, you'll never guess, our final song also features Granny. Really? Oh, yeah, her wrestling report. Turn this site around. Oh, it did. Man. NWA Championship Wrestling, September 20th, 1986. They showed Jim Cornette and Paul Ellering having a confrontation. Cornette in insulted Ellering, and so Ellering slapped him. Bill Dundee and Buddy Landell came out for a promo. So he slaps him, and Cornette's in the middle of going flying, and they pause it. Yes. At the perfect time. Yes. It's great. His hands are flying backwards, his head's flying backwards. Can I say something about this show before we get going? Yeah. That is what we're here for. This is not much of a show in the ring. However, and I know when I say this, Vinny is going to deny it, but then he's going to think about it, and then he's going to recap it, and he's going to realize I was right. Has there ever been a 45-minute show with this many fucking awesome promos in that 45 minutes? Probably not. Dude, They're everybody from Flair and Dusty all the way down to fucking lover boy Dennis Condry, yes. who I can't even <laughs> remember speaking maybe the only today. promo he ever cut. And it was a winner. Oh, it was a winner. This <laughs> show. I thought, I thought this show in a nutshell was a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Whoever it is, 
in WWE that's listening to this show and brought us the headbangers. Yes. Okay, do the company a favor this time and somehow get the word that everybody at the Performance Center needs to watch this episode of NWA World Championship Wrestling during the next promo class. Good call. Their minds will be blown. It's only 40-some minutes. It's 40 minutes! God, it was great. So it opened with Bill Dundee and Buddy Landell coming out for a promo. They listed all the other teams in the territory, but said those teams are just full of talk. Soon they would get the chance to win the U.S. tag titles and prove they were the best. Ran down Flair, Dusty, Magnum, everyone. Now let's not lie. This wasn't a good promo. This is not the, the show did not peak early. However, there is something to be learned from this promo that's a very, very important point here. This goddamn promo was fun. And it really hit me when I watched this. Even when the show is bad, I still have fun yes. watching it. Yes. Everybody who grew up with 605 TBS Wrestling, you ran home on a Saturday afternoon to make sure you didn't miss it. I was always certain to get the lawn mowed before this thing started. Why? Because it was so goddamn much fun. Yes. Professional wrestling was fun. And I was thinking about it. What promotion today on a national basis is really fun? Uh, Chikara would be closest. Not, I'm, I'm talking like you could turn on the television. Well, there's only three then. Well, Lucha Underground. Four. Is pretty fun, but, I mean, they're always talking about, it's a dark time at the temple. It mixes in fun with actual murder. Sure. It's a very serious sort of thing. Yes. Raw is... I mean, they have things that they consider fun acts like the New Day, but there's not an overwhelming sense of fun no. when you watch Raw, especially with the goddamn heel authority figures. No. SmackDown is... SmackDown, I guess, is kind of fun, but it's not like fun. Like, you rush to watch SmackDown on Tuesdays because it's so much fun to watch the show. Mm -hmm. Ring of Honor's fun, but not fun like this. It's, it's kind of like, it's just a good show. It's a solid wrestling event, but it's not fun like this. There's no promotion like this that's this fun anymore. No. That's what wrestling is missing. Fun. Baron Von Raschke versus Tom Barrett. Barrett deadweighted the Baron on a body slam, and almost immediately the Baron put on the claw hold and got the fuck out of there. Can you imagine fucking up a body slam? In 1986. With Baron Von Raschke. It's like one of the first things you learn in wrestling school. It's <laughs> yeah. had a post for a body slam. Yeah. This fucking guy was out to lunch. And by the way, if Carl or anybody who is a historian is listening, what was the point of grabbing your other arm when you applied a claw? I don't know. I, I need to figure this had out. Had to do something with it. Couldn't give a thumbs up. Hmm. I guess if I hold my hand like this and I squeeze my wrist, my fingers close. Yeah, See that? Exactly, yeah. So maybe when I squeeze it really tight, it makes the grip stronger. I'm going to try that the next time I open a can. I'm going to have Whitney hold the bottle. Sure. And I'm going to squeeze like this and then open the can or the... I'm going to try that. Can you do that in jujitsu? Grab your other hand when you grip? Well, use the iron claw. Uh, on the head? Yeah. You can try. Give that a go. Wang's got a good sized head for this too. So Cornette comes out for a promo. It's kind of weird how they did this, but he's out here to brag about how they had put Road Warrior Animal on the shelf, which would have been news to anyone turning into the show. Says the other Well, we missed some weeks. This may have aired on television last week. I don't think so, because it said recorded earlier, and he was wearing the same suit. The angle was recorded earlier today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, he says they're the first person to either put... Either Road Warrior on the sideline. Hawk was next, and then they were going to slap Ethering's face, too. And they start to leave. And David Crockett says, wait, 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 before you go, I want you guys to know that Hawk and Paul Ellering will be competing as a team in the U.S. Tag Title Tournament. Hawk and Ellering. Yes, and Cornette runs them down for a while, and he leaves. But this is actually important, because it would have made no sense for the Road Warriors to have not been in the tournament field. But you also didn't want the Road Warriors winning the U.S. tag titles. So this is how they get the Road Warriors in there without having the win. Because I'm going to guess Ellering got pinned when all was said and done. We'll find out. Yeah. 
What I do know is even when Cornette was cutting a serious promo, at the end, he threatened Paul Ellering. And as a fan, you can only help but giggle. Because you know that Jim Cornette's going to get his ass handed to him by Paul Ellering one of these days. Of course. That's fun. Ric Flair and Baby Doll come, come out for a promo. Does a classic Flair promo. He's screaming. He's out of his mind. Runs down Magnum. Run down, runs down Dusty. He plugs all his upcoming Midwest dates. Des Moines. Wichita, I think it was in there. And he says, you know, I've heard the women of the Midwest have been starving for a real man. And I'm going to be there to give them what they need. Baby doll standing right beside him. <laughs> she, you know her role. <laughs> she knows her role. It's been made abundantly clear on television. And then Flair acknowledged her. Baby doll will be right there with me. Yeah. I did not realize. I thought the free love era died in the 70s. Not when you're Ric Flair. Clearly. Clearly. And then he goes, Ric Flair and the four horsemen for as long as they want to be. <laughs> and I was like, that does not roll off the tongue. <laughs> like, diamonds are forever, and so are the Four Horsemen. Rock and, Roll, Rock and Roll Express versus Gene Ligon and Mike Simani. The Rock and Rolls won in a few minutes with the double drop kick. The only thing of value in this match was David Crockett going ape shit for the double drop kick. The only thing. America's team cut a promo. They're in their denim jackets and sunglasses. They promised to win the U.S. tag titles, and Dusty cuts a great promo on Tully Blanchard. God, Dusty cut a great promo. Some weeks he comes out here and he's just fucking around, and he just jibber-jabbers bullshit, but he's got great delivery. This time, this was a great professional wrestling promo, vowing to beat a man's ass. It was great. He vowed to maim Tully Blanchard and send him back to Texas. So they go to commercial. When they come back, Dylan and Blanchard come out for a promo. Dylan starts to talk, and it's it's good, but it's kind of cliche stuff about how everyone in this territory is a bad, tough man. Wahoo's tough, and Dusty's tough, and Magnum's tough, but the four horsemen are the toughest of them all. Yeah, but you know what? Mm -hmm. The difference between JJ and the Mike in 86 and 97 is stunning. Well, of course. Oh, my God. <laughs> Even just throwing that cliches, he was great. Yes. But then they go to Tully. And of all the great promos in the show, and there were great promos up and down the show, Tully was miles ahead of everyone else here. Tully's going off about how Dusty Rhodes comes out calling him by name, trying to intimidate him, trying to make him shake it and shake in his shoes. Well, he's out here in his $700 shoes and his $500 jacket. He's not shaking. And he goes off about how his, they've traded wins and losses over the years. But thinking back, Yes, he, he hurt Dusty's leg, which caught, caused Dusty to lose the world championship. And in recent years, he had beaten Dusty Rhodes to win the TV title, and he'd beaten Dusty Rhodes to win the national title. So no, Dusty, I'm not, I'm not intimidated by you. I'm not scared of you. I'm not shaking. He goes on for a while, but God, he was great. Every was week. So awesome. I am blown away by Tully. Like, everybody knows Tully Blanchard was great, but this man was underrated. Yeah. And remember a few weeks ago where he was all sullen because he lost his championship. Mm -hmm. He was downtrodden. JJ's trying to make him feel better and he's just not the same. That's over. <laughs> he got his confidence back somewhere. He got better. Probably some romp with flair. And women. Well, of course. Yes. When I say flair and romp. It's implied. There's gonna be it's not implied. A half dozen women it's a there. statement. Yes. What Tully was... Uh, Tully Blanchard was pro wrestling's answer to Scottie Pippen. There was a time when Scottie Pippen was like, he may have been the second or third best basketball player on the planet, but the problem was he was teammates with Michael Jordan. Mm. So he was never the guy. Tully was teammates with Ric Flair. So he was never the guy. So they go from this Tully Blanchard promo right to the ring where Arn Anderson is about to face Jack Jackson. <laughs> Jack Jackson. Jack Ass Jackson should have been his. <laughs> By the way, so I've mentioned many times, Ole Anderson and his trunks, right? Sure. He's got trunks and he had them designed With and he wanted, a, he wanted a specific number of stars in a specific pattern for no fucking reason. Mm -hmm. Arn's out there in baby blue trunks. Yeah. 
And I'm like, this, again, he had to order these. Yes. He had to specifically request, of all the colors in the fucking rainbow, can you make these in baby blue? And he wore them. And he kicked a man's ass in them. Maybe they were on clearance. He never saw Arn out there bedecked in gold and jewels. He was more of a working man who saved his money. So I presume he got these off some clearance rack. It fucking stagecoach boots or something. Baby Blue. All I know is, I don't know when. I don't know if it was a show we missed or if it was between now and then, but Arn Anderson has lost the TV title to Dusty Rhodes. And as the announcers pointed out, Dusty had even used Arn's own move, the Gourd Buster, to beat him. True humiliation. So the bell rings... And Arn turns to the announcers and lets them know whatever happens here is on Dusty Rhodes' head. And he turns around and he grabs Jack Jackson. And he goes for a power slam. But he lifts him up so high and brings him up, brings him down so violently and at such an angle, I think he accidentally invented the Northern Lights bomb. Just planted him right on his head. He's beating this man with arm bars and arm ringers. And a guy in the crowd shouts, that wouldn't hurt. And Arn looks at him and dares him to come in the ring, old man. This did not improve Arn's mood. He grabbed Jack Jackson. He hit a spine buster, throwing Jack Jackson down to earth with great speed, ass first, so his head bounced off the mat, and then picked him up and gore bustered him. I believe he was trying to gore buster him through the ring. Planted him, pinned him, five star squash match. I love when he hits a spine buster. And he's hitting the gourd buster, and David Crockett's on commentary, and he just quietly says, there is no defense. <laughs> he is defeated. <laughs> There's no hope. There's no hope. No so, can defend this fucking gourd buster. So Arn has barely broken a sweat in this unholy carnage he has unleashed. He goes to the uh, promo desk. He, managed to, he gets a promo about all the prices he had to pay. He was the youngest member of the Four, four Horsemen. He had to prove he belonged with the group. Then he said, yes, I lost that TV title, but before that, I beat. And he did a long, long, long list of names traveling the country, defending this title and beating men's asses. He said, yes, Dusty, you beat me one time. Maybe you even deserve to be champion, but don't you forget, there's all four horsemen are gunning for you now, and we're going to take you out by the end of the year. Another unbelievable promo. Why did they even bother doing factions for the next for the past 30 years? No one has touched this. No. Dude, why did they bother doing interviews? I don't know. Yes, the Four Horsemen were great, it turns out. So Corna and the Midnights come out again. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that Loverboy Dennis was going to cut a promo on this show. <laughs> he never has before. He may never have it again. But he comes out, and I'm just looking at him. And... It just struck me, Dennis Condry is the lover boy. Yes. He's out there, he's, and he's just so fucking disgusting. He's a sex symbol. He's got a bleached mullet, <laughs> a brown, dark beard. Yeah. His forehead is just carved up. <laughs> Hairy chest. Yeah. He's a little fat, and he's wearing dad jeans. <laughs> yeah. Just fucking standing there, looking at the camera like a creep. And I'm like, this guy's the lover boy. Keep in mind, most of the time when he wrestled, he'd be bare chested, but then with a bandana around the neck. Can I repeat how fun wrestling used to be? Yes. That a man like this was the lover boy. He was, he was Los Huapos before they even existed. That's right. Down in Mexico. That's right. So Cornette demands they show the angle that happened earlier today. And apparently there's this edition of uh, Saturday Night. Uh, whatever it's called, Saturday Night Wrestling. But they also did a morning show. And the morning show is where the confrontation between Ellering and Cornette occurred. So they get in each other's face. Ellering insults, or excuse me, Cornette insults him. Ellering slaps Cornette and he just slaps him and walks away like he's done. And the answer say, let's go to the ring. And there are the Road Warriors doing a squash with Mike Samani and somebody else. And about 30 seconds in, the Midnight Express jump Ellering at ringside. Cornette hits Animal with a tennis racket, which the announcers are sure to point out is loaded. And as uh, Hawk and Dennis Condry are messing around outside, Bobby Eaton drops a series of top rope knee drops to the back of Animal's head. Let's talk about the real highlight of this. Condry. Before that. Oh. 
Cornette and Ellering are having their deal, and Shivani is standing in the background with the biggest shit-eating grin, loving every moment of this back and forth. Ellering slaps Cornette, and Cornette does not take a bump. He takes a pratfall. Yeah. He leaps in the air, swings his arms and legs around, falls to the earth. So they go back, and Cornette's still there with the Midnights. And all of a sudden, to my shock... <laughs> The lover boy grabs the mic, mm -hmm. and he cuts a promo. Road Wars, you said you had trouble finding opponents. You must not have been looking too hard We're right here under your nose. He says the Road Warriors cannot beat them in a wrestling match. They couldn't beat them in a boxing match. They couldn't beat them singing. <laughs> they couldn't beat them dancing. I believe and, this, by the way. And if you want to, we can do a beauty contest, too. And then when he's done, he moves away from the mic. He starts to step to the side where he always stands. But then he stops, and he turns, and he looks straight into the camera, and he goes, Huh? <laughs> Puffing his chest out. Oh, yeah. Getting all bowed up. God, I fucking love this. <laughs> Cornet runs down the Road Warriors, vows to slap Ellering back. Tony Schiavone was so bewildered by all of this. Oh, this was... Five stars. So great. But Ru then... <laughs> but then... Dear God, Crusher Khrushchev was horrible. Okay, let me... First of all, before we get into the speech, let me set the visual for you. Left to right. It's Nikita Koloff, Ivan Koloff, and Crusher Khrushchev. And somewhere in there is Tony holding the mic. Nikita is wearing slacks. He is carrying the U.S. Championship belt... And he has no shirt on. He looks great. Ivan has a suit that may have been the same suit he wore the night he beat Bruno. Straight out of the 1970s. But he looked, he looked like he got dressed up for the show. Hey, when you buy a suit that expensive, you have it for 30 years. That's right. Crusher is in jeans and no shirt. Crusher did not have the same physique Nikita did. You don't say. Or Ivan. Or you. Or maybe Tony. This is a poor decision. So we're off to a bad bad start before he ever opened his mouth. How can you be such a horrible promo in 1986? I don't know. That takes talent to be that bad. He was horrible. I didn't even write down anything he said. Why wasn't he just a mute? I don't know. Barbarian was. I just know Barbarian at least growled, which is better than, I, than uh, Crusher. So I didn't write down one word he said. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. I do know that Ivan then spoke, and he cut a hell of a promo. Oh, yes, he did. As he always does. As he always does. Says they're going to win the U.S. tag titles, then we'll be top contenders of the world titles. Actually explained, he was talking about the Midnight Express and the Road Warriors killing themselves for, uh, for the world championships. He says, we could do that too, but we are going to use our brains. And he points to his head, where his brains are. He says, we, rather than get into a violent, bloody war, like the Midnight Express and the Road Warriors are doing... We will just go win this U.S. tag title tournament. Then we'll be top contenders. He plugs the unification match with Wahoo, which lets Nikita step in and run down Wahoo and everyone else. And he adds, Oh, Road Warriors, I see you are on the shelf now. I feel so bad for you. <laughs> what a great man. Oh, that's great. And then they, they're, they're leaving. They're walking out. Nikita leaves, Crusher leaves, Ivan takes a step away and steps back and says, I want to watch this match and see what these Kansas Jayhawkers have to offer. Jayhawkers. Jayhawkers. Well, they didn't have much to offer. Here is what I wrote for this match. You want to know what I wrote first? Okay, you go first. It's very simple. Okay. I wrote Tony Zane and Pablo Crenshaw versus Kansas Jayhawkers. My notes consist entirely of this sentence. Can't get over Bobby Jaggers. Okay, I guess mine, I, mine may actually have more detail than that. Here's what everything I wrote. Kansas Jayhawks versus Tony Zane and Pablo Crenshaw. Nothing happened for a while, and then the Jayhawks won. Basically. Okay. How is Bobby Jaggers not a jobber? I mean, I've seen fat guys before, but mm -hmm. it's like, he's fat, but he's talented. Sure. I'm sure Bobby Jaggers is a great guy. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's much more talented than he's shown ever on this show. I was not blown away by Bobby Jaggers here. Dick Murdoch comes out for a promo. This I was blown away by. 
<laughs> what a great baby face. He lists all the champions of the company. Some he likes, some he doesn't. He knows a lot of people are gunning for Dusty Rhodes and the TV championship, but he wants Dusty to know he's got friends on his side too. Speaking of friends, he says in this U.S. tag title tournament, at some point you're going to see friends lining up across each other from the ring. At that point, friendship's going to go out the window. It's too much at stake, too much on the line. This title is too prestigious. Now I'm entering this tournament with my tag partner, Ronnie Garvin. I'm happy to have Ronnie Garvin as a, talk, as a tag partner. I know he's a tough man. I've, I've seen what he can do, and hopefully we'll come out on top. He says, we're going to do our dead level best That's win right. those U.S. tag titles. Let me speak on this. So I'm sitting there. Saw a lot of great promos. Excellent promos. Best promos I've seen in 45 minutes. And I don't even know how long. And then up on the screen, on a night where we haven't seen a lot of great action, I see these words. Ron Garvin and Dick Murdoch versus the Mulkies. Giddy. <laughs> Almost died when I saw this come up on the screen. Garvin and Murdoch headlocked the shit out of these fuckers. If someone can alert Kevin Owens to watch this show... Kevin Owens loves him some headlocks, mm -hmm. but it's just a headlock. You're like, cool, he's doing a headlock to get some heat. If he could do headlocks like these dudes do headlocks, not only would you get heat for doing a headlock, but people would believe you were killing these fuckers. Women were howling at this unfortunate mulkey, who I'm quite sure had no idea what was going on in this match. He was baffled. <laughs> there was a point. Where Garvin had Mulkey A in a front face lock. Essentially a guillotine. And while holding him there with one arm, he tags in Dick Murdoch. Murdoch enters the ring, and they don't do a double team. Garvin just lets him go and steps out through the ropes. I've never seen a man more confused than this Mulkey was here. He was baffled. Have you, Brian, you used to do uh, magic tricks? Sure. Do you ever do a magic trick for a young child and they just couldn't figure out where the quarter went? Oh, I do with my baby right now. Yeah. Like, she really wants to grab the cell phone. Mm -hmm. And so she's reaching for it. I'll do like a flourish and put it behind my back. Yeah. And she literally will like look around the universe like it's vanished that in air. That is what the monkey did. Yes. What you just did. If, if you were to do the same thing to me, I mean, I know exactly how you did it, but I would say Brian has used sleight of hand and he has put the phone in his pocket or behind his back or on the floor or something. This Mulkey believed Ron Garvin stepped through a portal, perhaps to the upside down, to another dimension, to another world. He was just vanished. He couldn't figure it out. He transformed. Yes. Into the other man. Into, into, into uh, Dick Murdoch. Which is quite a transformation. Then Garvin tries to take him down with a schoolboy. The Mulkey does not kick out. He just lift a shoulder up. <laughs> and so Garvin won't let him up. <laughs> and for like 10 or 15 seconds, they're just in there in a schoolboy pose with the guy holding one shoulder up and unable to do anything else to escape. There's more. Crockett, by the way, is pissing himself with glee at li li literally everything Garvin did. So finally, Murdoch grabs this man and Crockett screams, you know what he's going to do? And he picks him up for the brain buster. And it's a long, slow, delayed brain buster. He's holding him up there for a while. And then he drops down to his ass and drops the guy in his head and pins him. Mulky B never even tagged in. No. He, when he hit the ring, his ribs were taped. So was, perhaps it was a legit injury and they just want to take it easy on the guy. But then they go to do the finish. You know, they, they always do the replay of the finish. Yes. And David Crockett does the play-by-play uh, -play for this point. I hope you wrote it all down because I did. I did not. I did. Well, I, I will describe the situation. I will let you say what he, what he wrote. But usually it's a move in slow motion, but it's a slow motion flying forearm or body press or leg drop. There's bodies flying somewhere, even in slow motion. This was a delayed brain buster in slow motion, <laughs> which required David Crockett to fill time. Oh, yeah. How did he do so, Brian? Well, he, first he very quietly says, getting ready to put an end to him. An end to him. Yeah, very poetic. And then he begins philosophizing. Philosophizing? Philosophizing? Philosophizing. 
philosophizing. Except he may have been philosophizing. He may have been philosophizing. He says, how would you like to be up there knowing Dick Murdoch is going to drop you on your head at any second? And then Dick Murdoch did. Yeah. <laughs> I have never enjoyed holds more than in this match. No. Actually, that's a good point. <laughs> there were nothing but holds, and it was so goddamn enjoyable. There was a point where, uh, for a moment there, I actually thought, Garvin is going full Zack Sabre Jr. And he did a hold where he like had the dude's arm tied up with his feet, with, with one foot, the other foot in his head, and then he reached down and pulled up a, the one leg in like a half grab. And Crockett was just crying with joy at this man being tortured. Like it was the dungeon. You know what's funny? Because like in a Zack Sabre Jr. match, he'll put every, he'll put somebody in a wacky hold, and then everybody will cheer, and then he'll let go and do another wacky hold. Ron Garvin puts this guy in this hold, which I believe was like, it may have been a sugar hold, but I don't think so, because he was standing on the guy's head. It wasn't behind the guy's neck. But it's like a it's like a crab, as you noted, with the foot on the head. And he stands there, and the guy can't get out, and so he keeps standing there. <laughs> And he stands there. And he stands there. And he stands there. And David Crockett starts to go, how's he supposed to get out of there? Yeah. There's no escape. There's no escape. And so Ron Garvin stood there. And he stood there. And he stood on the monkey's head for probably 30 seconds. And then finally he let him go to apply another hold. This match was great. <laughs> it was something else. Finally, we go back to the uh, podium. Where Wahoo McDaniel is standing there in a suit with his headdress and the national championship. Yeah, he's got a title belt, a beautiful suit jacket, and a goddamn gigantic fucking hum humongous headdress. Yes. Took up the whole screen. He says in his up upcoming title match, title unification match with Nikita Koloff, he knows Nikita's a big, strong, dangerous man, but he's not nearly as experienced as Wahoo. He believes his experience will give him the edge. When all is said and done, he's going to be the winner. He'll still be the national champion. Sure to clarify, his championship will be the superior one. And then he's coming after Ric Flair. Somewhere in here, he mentioned this, or it may have been Tony, but they mentioned this U.S. national title unification match would have been on the same show as the U.S. tag team title tournament. What a show that must have been. Gonna be a hell of a show. Newsworthy. That's right. And that was a show. Arn Anderson, the Mulkies, and uh, the Midnight Express made this a great show. Dude, Arn Anderson, and Tully. Tully Blanchard, Ric Flair, I tell you this. Condry, and you've forgotten half the show. I did. The show was unbelievable. Not much for wrestling, but See, absolutely I, I, amazing promos. I'm not even sure. I, I can't argue. I, I can't agree with that it's not much for wrestling, because I love the Arn Anderson squash match. I love the squash match. Well, yeah. There, well, I mean, if you love a good squash match, and this was a great show. There was no, there was no long Ric Flair versus Ronnie Garvin. There was no drama. Match. No, it was only forty-five minutes. But there, damn, some great promos. Great violence. 